Can I just pray before we go to God's word again? Father, I just pray that you would enlighten our minds, that you would speak to us, that you would continue to work in our lives. Thank you for this awesome time of worship. Thank you for families. Thank you for our kids. And what we want is to receive your word. We want to receive your word in in our hearts this morning. We just don't want to be hearers. We just don't want to sit here. What we want to do is hear what you have to say, and I pray that our hearts would be open to receive the seed that is your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. So we've started on this topic of the resurrection, living a victorious Christian life. Can you tell your neighbor that we're called to live victoriously? Can you do that? We're called to live victoriously. And I think that's a huge topic. I, sometimes we don't really understand what it means to live victoriously. But I really believe that God wants you to live in victory. That God doesn't want you to live in defeat, right? That the plans that God has for you are, are good, and at the same time, they, they are there to see the kingdom of God progress. And God didn't, you, didn't want you to start on this race for you not to finish it. God wants you to finish your race. God wants you to start well, and God wants you to finish well, right? So, so God's intention for us is to live victoriously. And I think this is, a, like I said, a huge topic. He doesn't want me to live in discouragement. He doesn't want me to throw the towel but he wants me to fulfill my calling and run my race. Um, I like what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 37. That's been kind of a, the theme or the central verse of all this when it comes to walking victoriously, when it comes to living victoriously, is that we're more than conquerors through him who loves us, that we are more than conquerors. That's pretty amazing when you look at the concept, more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. So. We're called to be more than a conqueror. It's hard to be more than a conqueror when you're already a conqueror, right? But you see here, there's, a, there's this emphasis on that we can live victoriously. And that's the heart of God. That's the heart of God for me and you, to live victoriously. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, it says, run, run in such a way to get the prize. Run in such a way to get the prize. So it's not about going into a race and planning to fail, right? If you go into a race, or you, like I said last week, when you look at the playoffs, they play to win. And, and we should play to win too. And when it comes to winning, it's to fulfill our race. It's to fulfill what God has placed before us. I believe God wants me to win in my marriage, right? And in your marriage. I believe that God wants you to win when it comes to your inner life, when it comes to your calling, when it comes to relationship when it comes to holiness, when it comes to living a life worthy of his call, he wants you to live victoriously. He doesn't want you to give up, and he doesn't want you to live discouraged. He wants you to know that in him, you are more than conqueror through him who loves you. And uh, what we talked about last week was, why can I live victoriously? Just to give you a little snapshot, just to build from there. How can I live, or uh, why can I live victoriously? It's because I'm forgiven. And we went through Romans chapter 8, and we gave this picture that we are forgiven. Uh, if I'm going to walk victoriously, I need to know that I'm forgiven. Right? When I know I'm forgiven, I can run the race. If I, if I walk in guilt, if I walk in condemnation, I won't be able to walk victoriously. So that's the first step. I need to know that I'm loved. I need to know that, um, that, that uh, Jesus died for me so I can be forgiven. The second thing we talked about is that I'm fused with Christ. According to Ephesians chapter 2, we're seated in the heavenlies right now. Wherever Christ is, I am. And wherever I am, Christ is. I'm fused with Christ. I'm one with Christ. I cannot be separated from Christ because he's in my life. We became one. That's pretty amazing, right? So this is why I can walk in authority and victory because I'm not living alone. I'm not in this journey alone. I'm in Christ. And, this, and the third reason why we can live victoriously is because I'm loved by God. You get up in the morning and you're loved by God. You know that God has his eyes on you and you know that he's sovereign and you know that he's on your side, that not, God is not against you. When you go through hardship and challenges in life, you don't want to come to the point where you blame God. You don't want to come to the point where you think you're alone. You want to know without a shadow of a doubt that you're loved by God. And that should be your foundation. 
So this is why I can walk victoriously. It's because I'm forgiven. Secondly, I'm fused with Christ. And thirdly, I'm loved. What I'd like to talk about this morning, the topic of this morning is, how do I walk victoriously? I believe how I choose to live my life will define if I'm going to walk in victory or not. The way I choose to live my life, it will define if I'm going to walk in victory or not. It's really a decision that I have to make. And there's three options I want to bring to you this morning. Three options that is before me when it comes to live victoriously. If I want to live victoriously or when it comes to life choice, I've got three options. The first one is I can do life on my own, my own way. I can do life on my own. And when I do life on my own, it's going to be very hard for me to live life victoriously. Um, when I trust my own reasoning. You know, some of us, we have a good education. Some of us, we have a good journey. And, and we can look back at our, at our tracks. We can look back at our success. And, and we can say, you know what? I'm good on my own. I can do this on my own. And I think this is a trap of the enemy when you do life on your own. It uh, d- doesn't matter if you're smart. doesn't matter the education that you have. When it comes to life, it's a challenge. Uh, we don't know what's ahead. We don't know the curves that are before us. And I don't think we can do it on our own. And sometimes that's how we live our lives, right? We have God in their back seat. We have God somewhere, but it's, he's not present. He's not with us. He's not in our daily life. And, and so when we do life on our own, Uh, When we carry life on our own, when we carry responsibly on our own, when we try to solve problems on our own, I I think we we can't hack it. This is where we experience burnout, when we carry stuff on our own. When we try to solve things and and we say, I can do this on my own, I think this is where we fail. We can't do it on our own. And it's, it, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that. And sometimes it seems weak to say, I can't do it on my own, but really... It's a statement of, stri- of strength when you say, God, I, I, I can't do it on my own. You can in me. And I need to come to this point where I believe that I can do it, on, I can do it with God, that, that I can't do it out of my own reasoning. And look what it says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26. He who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept, sa- kept, kept safe. The one that walks in wisdom will be kept safe, meaning that you walk according to God's, God's ways. But if you trust in yourself, you're a fool. That's what it says here. That if you trust and you rely on your own strength, you won't be able to walk victoriously in your marriage. You won't be able to live victoriously when it comes to your calling and what God has placed before you or even when it comes to your, your inner life. I can't do it on my own. I need supernatural Uh, influence, and that is the Spirit of God. This is where God comes in my life. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, look what it says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. Do not lean on your own understanding. Can you say that to your neighbor? Do not lean on your own understanding. And that's hard to do, right? Because sometimes we have an opinion for everything, right? We have an opinion of how this coach, what this coach should do when it comes to his team or how the government would, should be if you would be prime minister. We have a lot of opinions. And, and, and the thing here, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, what does it say? Acknowledge him. Invite him. Get his input, right? And he will make your path straight. So when I look at a path that is straight, I see victorious living. So what it says here, don't rely on your own understanding. Don't walk according to your own knowledge, to your own, own, own thoughts. You've you got to go to God. If you want to have a successful life that is fulfilling your mandate and running your race, you can't do it on your own. Secondly, sometimes we hear, well, trust your heart. Listen to your heart, right? You watch uh, whatever movie you watch. They'll say when this person doesn't know, doesn't know what to decide, you know, follow your heart, right? And sometimes we say that to people. Well, people don't know what to do in life. You say, well, follow your heart. Well, the thing is, you can't follow your heart. Maybe I'm blowing your balloon today. You can't follow your heart because your heart is like a vase, like a bowl. It's what is in your heart that influences you, not your heart, you see? 
So whatever is inside of your heart will influence how you do life. So when you say follow your heart, what you're saying is follow what you have inside of you. Let's say if you have hurts, you look back at your past and, and you're haunted by your past and, and you have unforgiveness, or let's say you, your self-worth is in your heels and you always want to prove yourself, or let's say that uh, when it comes to forgiveness, you have unforgiveness in your heart, or, or, or let's say that you're full of pride and, and, and whatever might be there, if that's in your heart, it's by this place that you will do life, by the, over, by the overflow of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. So when you say to people or where people say to to you, follow your heart. It all depends on what's inside. What's inside your heart? This is where you want to be renewed, right? This is where you want to be filled by, by God. There's more of God in you, less of you. Then for sure you will hear his whisper in your heart. But you can't follow your heart. And that's what you find in scriptures in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. It says, the human heart is most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? So we can't follow my feelings or my intuition. Well, I think, I feel, oh, because it might be influenced by my heart condition. And it is influenced by my heart condition. So I can't follow my heart. So when it comes to living a victorious life, option number one is to walk according to your own, uh, your own by yourself, on your, by your own understanding. And that's not going to work. Uh, you won't be able to fulfill God's calling if, if you live life this way. The, the second way that, you're, that you can live, it's to live according to culture. To live according to culture. It's follow the mass, follow the herd. Let culture dictate your belief and your lifestyle. And, and you're, we're bombarded by culture all the time. If you read the news on Reddit, you'll be bombarded by culture. Uh, on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer, you go in malls, you go on the streets, billboards, you're bombarded by info all the time, solicitation all the time. And the thing is, what will I do? Will I follow the mass? Will I follow the majority? Will I follow uh, the, uh, the herd? Or will I discern what God will is and walk according to his, his will? It's hard today because it's not like it was even when I was a kid. I look at the kids, all the info that is there, even for ourselves, we have a problem to have our eyes um, free from screens, right? You find that? You close your phone, you're looking for the TV. Your TV's uh, shut, you're looking at your phone, at your tablet. You have a problem to have eye contact with other people because you're always drawn to that screen. And this is where life is. Like, um, we had the chance to go out east uh, earlier on this week, and we were seeing people on, uh, at the airport, we, you know, on these uh, uh, fast tracks. And they're on this, these fast tracks, and, and you, you see five people, one beside the other, they're all on their phone. Kind of funny, right? And not at the same time. As there's no interaction, instead of interacting with someone, they go on their phone. You sit in the, the plane, the first thing the person that does on your right, on your left, goes to their phone. They don't want to connect with you. They're afraid. Or, or we live in this bubble, right? And, and so it, it's important for us to look at where, where, where do I get my values? Where do I get my values? Do I have my values from Walking Dead? Where do, I got, where do I have my values on which TV show? Uh, in every TV show, you can see that culture is pushing their values. They are all the time, little by little. They're picking, picking at the church, picking at you, picking at you. And, and the thought is the story of the frog in the kettle. Well, you put the, fo the frog in water and you boil the water slowly. And later on, the, the frog is not aware that it's being boiled to death. That's what's happening with culture. So you got to be aware that we live in a strong culture that's trying to influence you, and will you buy into culture? I want to read a text to you that I think it's so relevant. When you look at the Bible, the Bible is so relevant, even though it was written so many years ago, it, it, it's kind of like it was written for today. If you look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, look what it says. As for you, <clears throat> you were dead in your transgression and sins in which you used to live when you follow the, way to the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Other version will say the prince of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us 
used to live among them at one time, gratifying the craving of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Uh, like the rest, we were by nature objects to wrath, to the judgment of God. So here you see that before we were Christians, before we accepted Christ, and, and when we define Christianity, we have to say it's not about rules and regulations. It's about loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And if I pursue that, I really believe that I, I, I will follow God's way. So it's, it's, it's not to be caught by the law, but it's to be caught by the, the call of love, and we're called to love. But here it says, in the text I just read to you, that before we used to live under the, 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 the principality of the kingdom, uh, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, and the spirit that is now at work in those that are disobedient. And, and I, I look at the spirit, uh, the, the prince of the air, like it, it talks about, it doesn't talk, ab- it, it doesn't talk about a person, it talks about an influence, right? It talks about the prince of the air that, that tries to uh, change us and fashion us according to the principle that are contrary to God's word that comes from the devil. And, and so when you look at culture, it has its purpose. It, it, it tries to sway you and try to get you, suck you in in its belief. In, in the Bible, one of, uh, one of the examples that you find, it's, uh, it's the, uh, the, uh, the example of Babylon. We've, we've heard some songs, right, by the rivers of Babylon. Uh, so Babylon, we are aware of Babylon. And Babylon is really a city that existed in Mesopotamia that is in Iraq right now. It's a, it was a real city. And, but it's more than a city. It's a spirit. It's an influence. You find the spirit of Babylon in Genesis when the people were building the Tower of Babel, Babylon. Same location, same region. In Isaiah, in the middle of the Bible, you find... Uh, Isaiah 47, I'm going to read it in a moment. You find Isaiah talking about the spirit of Babylon. In the book of Revelation, it talks about Babylon the Great. And it talks about the influence of the world, the influence of culture. And he, and he describes it as the spirit of Babylon. And look what it says in Isaiah 47, verse 8. It's kind of it was written for us today. It says, now therefore, hear this, you lover of pleasures who sits securely, who says in your heart, I am and there's no one beside me. I am and there's no one beside me. And Isaiah was dealing with that when it comes to the spirit of Babylon in his days. And it's the same thing today. Never change. The same influence. Right now, it's really in our face because of technology. And it's like we live in this global village, right? So it's so easy to get caught by the spirit of the age. And the slogan of Babylon is this, I am and there's no one besides me. I live my life for myself. It's all about, it's all about me. It's all about my wants. It's all about my pleasure. And you look in verse 10. Isaiah goes a little further. He says, you felt secure in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge led you astray. And you, and you said in your heart, I am and there's no one besides me. It's a humanistic view of life where you focus on yourself, where you push God on the side, where you have self-worship, where instead of saying it's all about you, God, we say it's all about me. It's self-building, is that we do life on our own, and when we hit a crisis, we go to God, help me, but besides that, I I live my life according to what I want to do. And also self-indulging is whatever feels good, you do it. It just makes, makes you happy. Don't look at the consequences of your action, you don't, you're not accountable to no one. Just live life and, and just enjoy it for you because life is just about you. And this is the spirit of, of the age. This is where we live in. So the thing is, when it comes to have a victorious Christian life, if I adopt the ways of the world, I can guarantee you, you won't walk in victory. If you walk according to the spirit of this age, your marriage, I'm afraid for your marriage, I'm afraid for your well-being and in the, inside, the inside of your heart. When you look at everything that is there, if you just follow your heart and you do whatever you want, uh, your relationship, it won't be very strong. Your inner man won't be very strong. And you won't be able to fulfill your calling and why you're here, here on earth because I believe that we were made with purpose and significance. So the thing is, when it comes to walk in victory, I can't follow my own intuition. I can't follow my own intellect. I, I need God. And secondly, I can't follow culture and I can't follow my heart because it's not going to bring me where I want to be. 
And, and I know the bottom line is we want to experience pleasure. But the pleasure is way more than our senses. Or pleasure, the real pleasure, when I talk to my dad, when he, right now, he's, he's not in a good place, but when he was in a good place, and I talked about my dad and the last of his journey. You know, before, when he was younger, he worked and worked. It was all about work. And as he got older and older, he realized that how family was important. There's something that switched. When my mom was sick and died for cancer, it changed him totally because he realized that his wife and the family was the most important thing. You know, sometimes we, we get caught by the spirit of the age and we think it's all about that, but the older you get, the more you realize, you say like Solomon, vanity is vanity. It's like, just, it's like the pursuit of the wind. It doesn't go anywhere. And I believe that if I want to have a victorious life and I want to make a difference in my world and, and I, I want to find true happiness is when I do life God's way. I challenge you this morning. We have young families here that are just de dedicated their kids. Uh, I invite you to, to do life God's way. You know, the person of Jesus guarantees salvation and the principle or the teaching of Jesus leads me to victorious living. I think this is huge. The person of Jesus guarantees me salvation, but the principle of Jesus guarantees me victorious living. For example, if you want to have eternity inside of you, you have to have Jesus in your life. If you open yourself up to Jesus and you invite Jesus in your life, he's gonna come in and, and he's gonna secure you. He's gonna write your name in the book of life and you will have eternity inside of you. But it doesn't stop there. It's not because you have Jesus in your life, you will walk victoriously. Listen, the only way I will walk victoriously is when I follow his principles, when I follow his ways. If I stop at knowing Jesus and I put Jesus in my back pocket and I live the way I want to live and I pursue the world, I pursue my own intellect and I go according to my own, my own thinking, I won't live victoriously. I won't. The principle of living victoriously is when I look at the good book, I look at the Bible, I look at the teaching of Jesus and I follow them. I give my heart to walk according to his principles. Listen, his principles were not there to bring you captive, but to release you because they're good. It's like when you give instruction to your kids. When you say to your kids, don't go play in the traffic. You know, it's, I think it's a good thing, right? You know, don't drink that, uh, uh, that poison. You know, don't take uh, the, 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 the spray to clean uh, the oven and don't put that in your mouth. I, I think think it's a good thing that you say that, right? Well, you know, I'm going to leave my, my kids make decisions. That would be stupid parenting, right? Go play in the traffic and tell me if it's safe. No. So you see, <laughs> you see, when God gives us, it's for our own good. And, and like a rebellious child or like a, with a, a strong head or strong-willed child, he wants to go play in the traffic, right? He wants to, uh, I don't know, shoot darts at his brother or or whatever, right? Like, but you're there to guide them and to shepherd them. It's the same thing when it comes to God. He wants to shepherd me. He has me at heart, so he gave me principles to live by. And if I walk away from his principles, then I won't be able to live a life that is victorious, a victorious life. For example, you look at your marriage and you want to have a healthy marriage, go to see what God has to say about it. He might have something good to say about it, right? About forgiveness, about, about coming to him, about showing love, about generosity. You'll find some stuff that will help you. Maybe not things that your flesh wants to hear, but what your life is in need. And when you apply them, their life. You know that God blesses his word? And when you apply it, he's gonna bless you. Right? So, so you want to follow God's ways because there's life in God's ways. And Jesus said that he came to give life to the fullest, but I won't be able to have life to the fullest if I don't follow his ways. Christ guarantees me a place in eternity, but his word guarantees me victorious living. His word guarantees me victorious living. Look what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 13. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Do you like this? I like, I like to stop it here. God wants me to be, be the head and not the tail. God has great things in store for me. I like that picture. I don't like the tail. I like the head, right? I like to be on top. I like to be in front. I like to, to succeed. But look what, he, look what he says. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail, if you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God. 
that I will give you this day and carefully follow them, follow them. You will always be at the top, never at the bottom. He was talking to the Israelites. I think it's the same principle for us. If we follow the teaching of Jesus, we follow the teachings of Paul, we, we look at how we're called to live and we, we, uh, we align ourselves with the word of God, I believe you'll have success. I believe that you will be able to fulfill your race. I, will, I believe that you will, you, you will walk victoriously. First thing I need to do is I need to value God's word. I need to value God's word. Like he has something good to say. I, I wanna read a text in Proverbs chapter four, verse 20, that should be kind of a, our heart condition. Look what it says. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. For they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole bodies. I like this, right? Pay attention, listen, don't lose sight. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. And after that, you walk according to that and God blesses you. The Bible says, Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone, right? So you want to feed yourself of God's word. You want to store your heart with God's word. And because of that, because of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, then from the abundance of the heart, you will walk a victorious life if you store God's word into your life. Uh, when you go before God and you open the Bible and you ask God to speak to you, you know, you can approach God's word intellectually. But you can also approach it, and I think it's good to read it intellectually, but it's good to re read a chapter and say, God, what are you telling me in this? And this is where you have elimination. We call it rhema. The written word is the logos, and the rhema is God talking to you in that text. And it's amazing if you do that. Sometimes you will enter in God's word, you will read, and you'll read a chapter, and you'll take notes, you'll do journaling, journaling, and you won't be able to finish your chapter because there's gonna be too much bubbling up. And that's amazing, you read the Bible, you go for, through First Peter once, you go again and again, and there's always something that pops up. That's the work of the Holy Spirit that brings the word alive in you. And that's so amazing. So when you live according to that, you feed yourself from God's word, you give, a room, you give room for God to speak to you, I believe that you will walk victoriously. You will walk victoriously. Secondly, I need to apply God's word, that knowing is not enough. Can you tell your neighbor that knowing is not enough? It's not enough. I'm called to live it. I'm called to live it. I'm called to take a step. I'm called to apply it and believe that God's gonna bless it. I like what it says in James chapter one, verse 22. Listen to this. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are fooling yourselves. And at the end of the verse, it says, if you follow, if you, if you put into action, his word, then God will bless you for doing it. God's gonna bless you for doing it, you know? It's so easy to go away from God's word. You see churches walking away from God's word, and you see people walk away. It's even, it's even affecting the church, and when that happens, you don't see the Lord's blessing. God blesses his word, and when you apply it, when you choose to live according to his ways, his standards of love, um, He's gonna make a big difference in your life, you know? Um, in Matthew chapter seven, verse 26, it says, build your house on the rock and not on the sand, right? So we know what it means to build a house on the sand. You build on the sand, the storm comes, the wind comes, and then what happens is that your house goes with the sand, right? Have you ever tried to build a little castle on the beach? Well, it doesn't, if you think it's gonna stay there for un until next week, it's a good chance it won't, right? It's gonna be washed away. You build your house on the sand, it doesn't stay. But it says to build your house on the rock. And what is the rock? People will say it's Jesus. Well, the text talks about obedience to his word. That's the rock. The rock is when you apply God's word because God's gonna bless it and God's gonna be in it. So when it comes to living victoriously, it's about stepping in God's word. It's not about feelings. It's not about emotion. It's about Obedience. One last time, can you tell your neighbor it's about obedience? It's about obeying God's word. It's about following his ways. It's about saying, God, I'm gonna walk like you want me to walk. And when you do that, God's gonna be in it and you'll be able to walk victoriously. And it's also not to quit, not to start and stop somewhere. I like the story here of this king. If you have 
your Bible, take a look at 2 Kings chapter 13, uh, verse 18, and I won't spend a lot of time here. I could spend a lot of time here, but I won't. It talks about the king, Joash, king of Israel, and, and the Arameans Ar- Ar- were there, and they were, uh, they were circling Israel, and there was, uh, they were afraid of uh, being conquered by these enemies. And so the king goes to see Elijah the prophet, and just, that's just before Elijah dies. And he says, hey, help me out. We need to have victory here. Uh, can you help me out? And Elijah told them, well, open the window and, and shoot your arrow through the window. And the, and the king did that. And then after that, look what um, the prophet says to the king. He, then he said in verse 18, Take the arrows, and the king took them. Elisha told them, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. And the man of God, the prophet, was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have, had, you would have, you would, you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it, but now you will defeat it only three times. So you see here the story is the prophet says to the king, take your arrows and shoot your arrows in the ground. So the the king takes his arrows, he shoots one arrow, two arrows, three arrows, and he stopped at three. Why did he stop at three when God told him to shoot all of his arrows? There was a mental game here, right? Oh, does, will God really give me victory? Uh, will God be there? Like, is there a difference? Yeah, if God tells you to, to, to shoot all your arrows, what do you do? You shoot them all, right? And here it talks about persistent. It talks about follow through. You don't stop in the process. Listen, there's things that you know that you're called to do. There's things that you've heard God on. And because of circumstances, because of fear, because of uh, your environment, you stop. You stop at three. But God wants you to persevere. God wants you to continue. And maybe you gotta take, you gotta pick up your bow again. You gotta take back the arrows in your hand and say, hey, I know you've called me to do that, but I've dropped the ball, Lord, and I'm not not following through in this. So here today, I'm gonna take my bow back, and I'm gonna shoot my arrow, I'm gonna shoot all my arrows, I'm gonna go all out. And I believe when you do that, again, you place yourself in, in, in a place of victory. And that was conditional, right? God had a plan, God had victory over the enemy, but the king stopped at three and then the prophet says, you know, you're gonna only win three times. You, you're, gonna, you're gonna resist them three times, but if you would've shot all your arrows, you would've destroyed that nation. Just to say that it's important for us to follow through and not to give in to the pressures and the temptation and the lies of the enemy. So when it comes to doing life God's way, you want to value his word, you want to put it in practice. And my last point here, I need to trust God's word. I need to trust God's word. One of the things I've learned when I was a kid, because I, I, live, I, I was raised in northern Ontario and it was, it was in the bush, it's to trust my compass. It's to trust my compass, you know, it's you follow that needle. Don't follow your feelings. Don't follow where you think. I don't know how many times I've argued with my compass. I looked at my compass and I said, stupid compass. Because you're not giving me the right direction. One time I have to say, though, I had this compass of mine. And the needle was off and uh, was off the, 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 like the tip there. And it was always pointing in the, right, in the wrong direction. And I followed the compass and it was not good. But I'm not talking about this story here. Most of the time, the compass is reliable, right? That's why the best thing to do is to bring two. So the thing is, <laughs> just in case one, you, you buy one at Walmart for 10 bucks and then you buy a really good one, right? <laughs> but the thing is, I don't know how many times you're in the bush and you look at what's around you and, and, you, and you're lost. And you look at your compass and you say, it must be off, it must be wrong. I think it's the same thing when it comes to life. Sometimes we do life and you say, should I apply God's principle? Like when it comes to being honest in the business when everybody is not, it's telling the truth when people are not, being humble, raising up people, valuing what others have to say, having eye contact, showing love, forgiving. You know, sometimes you, you say, if I apply this, I won't be able to do what I'm called to do. I won't have, I won't have success. It's the opposite. You gotta trust in God's word. It's like the farmers right now that are preparing to, to, to seed, and maybe you already began to seed. But let's say when you, you seed, you expect to see a fruit, right? You, you, if you're sowing seed, that's why you sow, because you expect a harvest, right? I, I've gotta, I, you've got to know that when you apply God's word, listen, this is pinnacle of my message, 
that if you apply God's word and you live according to God's word, God will make it grow. God will make it grow. If you sow God's word, if you water God's word, and your intention is to do God's will, and your intention is to honor him by your lifestyle, he is going to make it grow. If you keep at it, if you persevere, you stay on the path of doing his will, following his word day in and day out, and sometimes it's not easy, right? To show love to people that don't return it, it's not easy. But to say, God, you've called me to do that. You've called me to be generous. You've called me to forgive. You've called me to walk in the truth, to speak the truth. You've called me to walk according to your word. He's going to bless his word in you. And, and, and when you do that, you will see a harvest. You might not see it today like a farmer planted the seed, plants the seed today, or not today, yesterday, and he doesn't look at the seed. Is it, he knows it's going to grow, but it's, he doesn't know when, exactly how, but he knows it's going, to, it's going to grow. It's the same thing. When you sow God's word, when you live by God's word, you will see it grow. I like what it says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. It says, do not let, God is talking to um, Joshua before the promised land because he was the new leader of Israel. And the thing is, he had big sandals to fill. He was replacing Moses. And he was a little worried. And God says to him, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. From your mouth. It doesn't say from your heart. From your mouth. Meaning that he, he verbalized it. He, he, he talked to himself. He, he heard him say, himself say the word of God. So he did that. And secondly, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do what everything written in it so that you might apply it. Look at the end what it says, then you will be prosperous and successful, then you will be victorious. Pretty amazing, right? So you sow God's word, you live by God's word, and you expect God to, to multiply his word to make that seed grow in your life. I don't know where you are in this journey of life. Maybe you came with a friend today, and, and maybe you came because it was baby dedication. I know one thing is that God really loves you, and God has victory for you. And the only way that you have victory is when you absorb him in your life, when you say yes to him. Like you'll find meaning if you give God a chance in your heart, if you invite him in your life. And maybe you were raised in Sunday school, and we know this region. We know that a lot of people went to church, and we know that church is important in the life of people, but sometimes it, be it can become a tradition. And maybe Christ is not vibrant in your heart. He's not real in your heart. You're not following his ways. I'm gonna tell you that if you embrace God and if you embrace his ways, you'll see your change, you'll see a change in your life. God's gonna rock your life, it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be phenomenal to see where he's gonna lead you, but really what you have to do is you have to open up. You know, God is a gentleman, he doesn't force his way in us. He, he invites us, he brings, he sets the table, and it's for us to decide. My prayer this morning, is that you would decide and you, say, you would say, I want Christ in my life, I want in my life, and secondly, I will walk according to his ways. Maybe you need to press, on, you need to press the reboot button, button. You need to press the reboot button and say, I need to start fresh here. I'm, I'm following my own instinct or maybe I am following culture and it's not working. <laughs> For sure it's not working. But if you follow God, follow his ways, you'll see the change that he will bring in your life. I would ask you to stand. With all the eyes closed this morning, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, you've never asked Jesus to come in your life, like I said, it, it, it's not religion. It, it's not a way of thinking. It's a person. God wants to be personal in your life. And, and Christianity is called to be experienced. It's, call, it's called to be experienced. God wants to come in your life. And, and you will experience him. It's way beyond knowledge. It's way beyond the intellect. It's a supernatural encounter between you and God. And God wants in, but it's up to you. It's really up to you. My prayer is that you would say, God, come in my life. If that's you this morning, I'd like you to raise up your hand. Someone here this morning. Yes, thank you on the side. Thank you on the side. Awesome to see. Yes, thank you so much. Awesome to see your hands come up. 
And how many of you, you've drift, drifted from the faith or you were raised in a Christian home, but you're not following him right now. Uh, you know you're not following him. You might put an act on, people may think, but deep down in your heart, you're not following him. I invite you just to raise up your hand and say, that's me. Someone here. Thank you. Someone else. Mm. Don't want to miss anyone. Lord God, we, we, we commit our lives to you. You want, to, you want us to experience you. We, you want us to experience you as our Lord and Savior. So we say, yes, come in my life. Come and dwell in my life. I, I ask you to make me your house. I ask you to come and fill my life, God. I want you in my life. I give you my life. I give you the driver's seat. I give you the will. Take the will. Mm. Fill me of your spirit. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. And Father, give me a desire to follow your ways. Give me a desire to walk according to your word. Father, for all of us, I pray this morning that you would create a desire to live life according to your word. Father, you've called us to live victoriously, that we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. And we want to live in victory to help us, Holy Spirit, to follow the words of Christ. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen.